Um, I am I am happy to introduce um, our next two speakers, uh, Stacy and Jason. Stacy is going to, I think, kick us off here. Stacy Porter, who is a postdoctoral scholar and is at the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center. And Stacy got her bachelor's degree in North Carolina, North Carolina State University, Asheville, and then went off to Alaska and started drilling ice cores, I imagine, um, and now is um, as a postdoc working with the, um, the, the Arctic polar uh, research. Jason Cervenek, and please correct my pronunciation of your name, is the Education and Outreach Director, a proud Buckeye who got his bachelor's and master of education at The Ohio State University. Um, looking forward to hearing from you both. Thanks for having us. All right, hi there, everyone. Hopefully you all can see me. Um, I'm gonna just share my screen here and we'll jump right into it. I don't know if, um, Jason, if I'll, I can handle it, but if you wanna field questions maybe, that would be helpful. Sounds good, Stacey, thanks. All right, thank you. So with our, our limited time here, um, I just wanted to first give you a little introduction into our center. Um, so this is what you would see um, when you walk in the door um, of our main lobby, if you were here on an actual tour. Um, and this is a picture of Admiral Byrd, our namesake. Um, so we are the Byrd Polar and Climate Research Center, but we started off in, the 19, uh, in 1960 as the Institute of Polar Studies. And we were the first research institute on Ohio State's campus. Um, and then in the 1980s, we changed our name to the Byrd Polar Research Center. And that was after we acquired um, the Byrd Papers. So all of Admiral Byrd's um, journals, diaries, equipment, gear, things like that all up, went up for auction and we put in a bid and, and acquired all of those materials. So we're named after Admiral Byrd, who was a really famous polar explorer back in the 1920s and the 1930s. So he was considered one of the first people to fly over the North Pole, um, although when they went back and checked his journal entries, he might not, he quite didn't quite make it um, to the North Pole, but he was very, very close. Um, he also famously overwintered uh, at a research station in uh, Antarctica all by himself, where he um, almost passed away from carbon monoxide poisoning from a stove that was malfunctioning. Um, but fortunately, he survived. Um, and so now we can kind of continue on his legacy um, exploring the poles. But in 2015, we changed our name yet again to the Bird Polar and Climate. Research Center. Um, and we added climate because firstly, we don't just work in the polar regions. Um, as I'll talk to you today, we, we have ice cores, for instance, from all around the globe, um, including the tropical regions. So we don't just work in the polar regions, but also we've got many different research groups at our center. And today I'm only gonna focus really on the ice core group, but there are many other research groups and they all work in some sort of aspect um, of climate and climate change. It influences you know, almost every aspect of our lives. Um, so it was really important for us to add that to our name. So that's a really, really brief uh, history of our center. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is let me make sure I can hide these. All right. So we will start our tour here. So I'm gonna head down the stairs to our basement, um, which is where the ice core group is housed. And to give you just a little um, insight here, I am reporting to you from this office right here. So, but this is what our hallway looks like. Um, and before I get into all of the, the really cool aspects of the things that we can learn from ice cores, I thought, why don't we go get one? Um, so I'm gonna take you on a different virtual tour really quick. Um, and thankfully we have all of these amazing tours that you can go on um, with our virtual ice.bird.osu.edu um, website. We've got all these different sites with 360 video that you can go to. Um, so I thought we can go to Kelkaya, the Kelkaya ice cap in southern Peru as part of the Andes. And we can go drill an ice core and then we'll bring it back to Ohio State and we'll see all the cool things that you can do with it. All right. 
So this is an overlook um, over the city of Cusco. Um, if you've ever been to Machu Picchu or considered going to Machu Picchu, you would probably make a stop here in Cusco. Um, Cusco is at about 11,000 feet in elevation. So you really feel the thin air when you get there, especially once you have to start exerting yourself in any way. Um, you can't quite do it the way you normally would. Um, but this just shows you also the city, uh, Cusco has about 500,000 people um, with it. And the glaciers in the Andes are really like water towers um, for not only Cusco, but many cities along the Andes. So as these glaciers begin to disappear, we have to consider you know, how these people will adapt to you know, fewer water resources, fresh water resources. So on our road um, to Calcaya, um, you can see again, we've got the glaciers here in the back, um, just starting to see them um, over that ridge. Um, you can see our vans here. This was hauling our equipment. I should mention this was um, what we would call a shallow drilling expedition. So we were only getting just a few meters of ice um, if we're doing a deep drilling campaign, which would go all the way down to bedrock, you would have much more equipment involved. Um, but for this one, it's just a, a small drilling campaign. So we didn't need too much. Two vans and a truck was, was enough to get us there. So we'll head on down to the end of the road which is exactly what you would think it is. It's where the road ends. Um, so now I think we're at about, I wanna say about 13 or 14,000 feet in elevation. Um, so this is where we, we camp um, because it's about a day's drive from Cusco to the end of the road. And then it's about a day's hike from the end of the road to our base camp. So this is where we first camped overnight. Um, just a side note, it was my first time ever camping in a tent. Um, by myself. So that was um, a unique experience. So um, as part of this ice cap, um, the Kelkaya ice cap, there's lots of little glaciers that flow down um, into, into the mountain valleys. And one of them is the Cori Kalis Glacier. And we've been going to Kelkaya uh, since the 1970s. So we have this excellent record of the changes that have occurred in this region. And we can do that just with photogrammetry. Um, so taking pictures of, of where the glacier has been um, and how it's changed over time. So you can see here, and these were um, done by um, primarily Henry Brecker, um, who's retired now, but still comes to work every single day. Um, so you can see here, this is the glacier in 1970. 1978, you see this beautiful, robust glacier. In 2002, you can see that it has retreated quite a bit and you now see a large lake forming there. In 2011, you can get a better uh, glimpse of that lake here. And that lake is about, I wanna say 84 meters wide and about 200 feet deep. Um, so there's a lot of water that's stored there and it's in sort of a precarious location. And when I switch here to 2015, you'll see what I mean. Um, you can see some evidence here of what we call a glacier lake outburst flood. So either a large boulder or a large piece of ice fell into this lake, that water breached and then ran down into the valley. And so these can be really, really dangerous for the people that live down in the valley. Um, one of these occurred in 2006 and um, a lot of the farmers that live down in the valley lost their livestock. Um, so they're llamas, alpacas, horses, whatever they happen to be breeding. Um, but these things can be very deadly as well. And the more the ice retreats, the more that these lakes build up with water um, and the more and more lakes that form. Um, so it's, it's something to keep in mind um, when we're exploring these regions. So again, in 2016, you can see how, how much the glacier has retreated and in 2018 um, as well. And that was the last time um, that we were down at that site. Hopefully we'll get to go back again sometime soon. All right, so I'm gonna take you back to our end of the road camp. So this was going towards the hike um, to our base camp. And again, I just want you to kind of see um, the region. Um, it's, it's a really beautiful landscape. One thing you'll notice, um, when we're walking, we don't have all of our equipment. Um, fortunately, we can hire um, a lot of the local farmers who are willing to help us um, with their horses and their burrows. 
um, to help carry our equipment. And that brings, you know, a little bit um, more finances into their economy as well. Um, and since we've been going to the site for, you know, over 40 years, uh, we have a really good relationship with the farmers in this region. So on this day's hike, um, this is, these are pictures from 2016. I was there in 2015 and we had to walk through essentially a thunderstorm, um, which was pretty dangerous um, considering you're basically inside the clouds at this elevation. Um, and we could feel the hail and, you know, lightning was pretty close as well. So um, one of the things I want to show you here, this is our base camp. I think we're now at about 16,000 feet in elevation. Um, so you can see this is the Bofidals where we are essentially our water source. So as the glacier melts a little bit, it goes down into these streams. Um, so this is the water that we use. Um, I'll take you to the Boulder Lake in a minute. You'll see pictures of that when we go to the hallway. Um, but for now, I'm going to take you to our fossil plant lake. Um, so many of these lakes are forming all around the ice, as I mentioned before. And as the ice retreats, um, some of the things we began finding were these little plants. Um, so they weren't new and, you know, growing and thriving or anything. They were dead, uh, but they hadn't decomposed because they'd been preserved within the ice. So these plants were first found in 2002, um, right along the edge of the ice. And I'm going to show you a little bit about what these plants look like. Um, so just a little video here. I'm just realizing that video might have been a little bit choppy because I don't think I optimized for, for video, but hopefully you could see um, what those plants look like. Um, for me, it was really hard to tell. They just sort of looked like mud to me. Um, but in 2002, when these plants were first found, they were determined to be about 5,200 years old, uh, which tells us a couple things. Firstly, it tells us it was a very different landscape 5,200 years ago. If you look around now, you don't see too much um, in the way of plant life. It also tells us that something happened somewhat abruptly because it's not as if it got colder and the plants died and then the snow and ice came. The snow and ice came and it stayed and we know it stayed for those 5,200 years because if it hadn't, those plants would have been exposed, they would have decomposed and we never would have found them. So this can also give us an idea of the uh, rate of retreat in the ice. So as we continue to go back to this site, the plants that we're finding are getting older and older, which tells us, you know, if we've got plants, the youngest plants we've ever found were about 4,700 years old, and the oldest plants we've ever found have been about 6,700 years old. So that means it took 2,000 years for the ice to advance and only decades for it to retreat. So we know that the rates of change that we're seeing today are really unprecedented. So we'll move along to our lake outlook. Um, again, many of these lakes are forming um, all around the region. And I'm gonna go to uh, this new lake, which actually was not even there um, in 2015. This formed in 2016. And then we'll head up to the summit. So at the summit of Kelkaya, we're at about 18,500 feet. Um, I'm going to pan around all the way around here so you can see this expanse of, of ice that we're on. Um, and as we start to look towards the east, one thing you'll notice is kind of in the background here, just above this blue button, um, there's a cloud deck back here. So these are clouds over the Amazon rainforest. Um, so one of the things, you know, they get these huge explosive thunderstorms over the Amazon and those thunderstorms can pump a lot of uh, different materials onto our ice. It could be things like bugs or insects or plant fragments. Um, it could be, you know, 
Smoke can come if there's wildfires in the Amazon, we can get smoke residue from those on the ice. Um, so lots of different influences from, from the Amazon rainforest at this site. So I wanna show you just really quickly, um, this is one of the snow pits that we dig when we're there. Um, it's a few meters deep. Um, you can see our researchers, I think Emily and Roxana, they've got these Tyvek suits on um, to make sure they don't contaminate the ice. And we'll see how important that is later. Um, but you can see them here just taking samples, kind of marking the way as they, as they go along. They've got a little tool that's almost just like a hollow tube that you can kind of shove into the ice and pull back out to, to retrieve samples. So we typically try to, you know, dig at least one or one snow pit when we're there to get samples. Let's see here, there we go. I can get back out. And then the last thing on um, Kelkaya that I want to show you is just the drilling of the core. Now, as I said, this was a shallow core, uh, so we didn't need the big drill that I'll show you later. Um, we were just using a hand auger, um, which you can just sort of turn on your own, so it's, it's human powered. Um, but this, this shows you what it looks like. You can hear them. Um, you can see here, this is the hand auger going in um, that they turn. This is what the, the ice looks like. It's not quite ice at this stage. It's just really, really compacted snow or what we call fern. Um, so you can see them cutting the samples here. They go into these Ziploc bags. And then we ship these back to Ohio State to study. Um, so fortunately with this campaign, um, because it was shorter, um, we just sent these back and let them melt along the way. We didn't have to bring them back frozen. Um, when we're doing a deep drilling campaign, we do bring the ice cores back frozen. So that's essentially getting um, an ice core. It was a shallow core, but nevertheless, that's how we get one. Um, so what I'm gonna do next is take you to our building and let you see um, how we analyze uh, the ice when we're here. And if there's any questions, please go ahead and, and pop them in the chat. Um, all right, so as I mentioned, this is our ice core hallway. Um, this picture right here is a little difficult to see, but it's the edge of the Kelkaya ice cap. Um, and it has these really neat layering um, visuals that you could see. And it essentially shows um, you know, what we're looking for in the ice cores. Um, we tend to get these really beautiful annual layers in this region because it has such a distinct wet season and dry season. So of course, during the wet season, you get your snowfall. And then when it's dry, you get dirt and clay and sand kind of kicked up from the surrounding areas. And that creates kind of a thin dark layer. And then the next year you get more snowfall. So we can drill down into these ice caps, pull up you know, that, that tube of ice um, that you saw before. And then we have a record of all of those layers. And those layers can go back hundreds of years, thousands of years, even hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so from the properties of that ice, we can determine what the climate was like when that layer was deposited. So what the climate was like hundreds of thousands of years ago. So one of the things I wanna show you is what we call Boulder Lake. Um, so kind of getting back to the Kilkaya site um, and showing you the changes that have occurred in this region. So we've got these pictures starting in 1977 and you see this large boulder and the ice is right up against that boulder. And so just keep your eye on the boulder as we go through the years and you'll see the perspective will change a little bit, but you'll see how far back the ice is retreating. So in 1979, the boulder is free from the ice. 1995, you can't even see the ice in the picture. So then we start to change the perspective here, and move to the other side of the boulder. Um, so in 2000, you can see um, where the ice is and there's now this frozen lake um, in 2000. But if we look in 2015, you can see that that lake is no longer frozen. Um, shameless self plug, that's me right there. And then as we continue on to 2016 and 2018, again, you can see how far back um, the ice is retreated. And again, we have this really large lake here, which is in a really precarious location. There's a huge drop off um, just to the right of these pictures um, that you can't see. So again, just something to um, consider. There we go. All right. 
So we've got our ice um, from our region. Now it's time to do some analysis on it. So we're gonna go into our class 100 clean room. So you can see here, this is our um, clean room. Um, all of these little cups that you see are filled with ice core samples. Um, this is again, our researcher, Emily, um, doing measurements on the ice. Um, a few of the instruments we have here, this one in the back right here is a coulter counter. It's what we use to measure the dust content of the ice. Um, so dust can tell us about drought events or you know, wind directions, even if we know the source of the dust, if it's coming from you know, the Sahara Desert or from a local desert, um, the dust content can help us with that. It's actually the same type of instrument that measures blood cells in hospitals, um, but we've adapted it to measure the dust content. Um, as I move around here, we've got an ion chromatograph, which we use to measure the chemistry of the ice. Um, so that could be uh, things like you know, potassium or calcium, um, sodium, chloride, um, or even things like sulfate, nitrates, um, which are pollutants. Uh, they do have natural forms, um, but we see this big uptick in sulfates and nitrates based on human activity. If I scroll around a little bit more here, uh, over here we have what's called an SP2. Um, it, this is used to measure black carbon. Um, so black carbon is the result of incomplete combustion. It can come from things like car engines or from things like wildfires. Um, but it has a really big consequence on the ice because it's dark and it absorbs a lot of solar radiation and heat and it'll warm up the surface of the ice um, and melt the ice more quickly. Um, so something again that we have to consider when we're on the ice is, is how quickly it's melting and if it's due to again human activities. But also, as I said, you know, black carbon can come from wildfires. Um, so we could get a history of wildfires in a region, say like, you know, from, from the Peruvian Andes, we might see a fire history of the Amazon. Uh, so we have another ion chromatograph um, in the back there, again, just to measure the chemistry of the ice. And one of the instruments we don't have here is our Picaro, which we use to measure the isotopes. Um, so we look for the isotopes of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, it's what our ice is made out of. Um, but essentially, we're looking for these heavier versions of hydrogen and oxygen. Um, they just have a couple of extra neutrons, so they've got a little bit more mass to them. And we can use these to measure temperature because it takes more energy uh, for the atmosphere to evaporate these heavier molecules and move them to our drill site. And the atmosphere gets its energy from heat. So we know that if we see these heavier versions of hydrogen and oxygen, that it was likely warmer at that time because the atmosphere had enough energy to move it there. Just like us, if we you know, have to move something heavy a long distance, we need a lot of energy to do it. You can see also here, the floors are elevated and there's holes in them, um, and that's to make sure that nothing settles um, so the air can constantly circulate and filter and stay really, really clean. So that is our clean room. So we'll head a little further down the hallway, and I wanna show you our drills here. Um, so these are the drills that we use in our expeditions um, if we're doing our deep drilling um, campaign, so not the hand auger that we were using. Um, we've got two types of drills here. Um, on the left, we have our mechanical drill, our electromechanical drill. It just has blades down at the end that kind of spin and cut up the ice around it. Of course, it's hollow, um, so that's where the ice core will go. Um, and we do about a meter at a time, um, pulling up, um, again, one meter at a time and just going down the same hole. And then we also have our thermal drill, um, which has these coils down at the end. Those coils will heat up and help us move through the ice. So depending on the properties of the ice, that'll determine which drill you want to use. Um, more often than not, we use our mechanical drill. It's quicker, um, a little bit easier to use. Um, but you always can encounter um, what's called the brittle zone. So it's this area of the ice where it's really, really cold, really pressurized. And if you try to go in there with a mechanical drill, you'll just shatter everything like glass. Um, and that's when we want to switch to our, our thermal drill. But these drills were designed in our machine shop, which is just around the other end of the hallway, specifically to go to these really high elevation sites. Um, so if you're working in um, Greenland or Antarctica, you kind of have the luxury of being able to fly in your equipment. You can land a small plane or a helicopter, but when you're on top of a mountain, you can't do that. 
So anything you wanna have at your drill site, you have to be able to carry up yourself. You can use pack animals like yaks or mules or horses or whatever's available. Um, but essentially it has to be really lightweight in order to get it up the mountain. Um, so that's why these were designed um, by us to be really lightweight um, so that we can carry them up to these really high elevation sites. So I'm gonna continue on here. All right, so I wanna show you this picture here just really quickly of um, how we transport our ice. Um, so typically, you know, when we're in the field, our cores would go into like a snow pit or a snow cave just to keep them out of the sun. Um, but eventually they do have to come down the mountain and we do have to get them back to Ohio State. So they go into these silver tubes, um, you know, one meter of core at a time. And these will kind of reflect sunlight while they're in transport. Um, then we put them into these boxes, which we can fit about six tubes um, of ice into these boxes. We throw in um, some ice packs like you see here. You can see the box is really heavily insulated um, and we throw another thick layer of foam on top. In a few of the boxes, we also put um, temperature loggers so that we can make sure that the ice never gets above freezing. Um, so we'll know the temperature inside the box. Um, again, just to make sure we have all of our logistics planned out. And so once they're packed like that, they can stay like that for about three to four days until we find some sort of refrigeration, whether it's you know a refrigerated truck or a standing freezer um, or a shipping container or something that can keep them uh, frozen when they're transported back. But all of these logistics have to be planned ahead of time, you know, really well in advance, because when you're working in really remote regions of the world, you know, finding a standing freezer or a refrigeration truck isn't always a guarantee. Um, and then not only that, you have to make sure everything's in working order. It's always nice to have backups just in case, because um, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I think there was uh, a story of um, an incident, I think, in China when one of the refrigeration trucks broke down. Um, and what they did, I think, is um, buy out all of the ice cream from a local shop and then use those freezers to try to maintain the cores. Um, but fortunately, we've never had a major incident. Um, we've, we've been able to you know, return all of our cores to Ohio State in, in, intact. Um, so we've been very lucky in that sense. So I wanna show you um, a quick video of what the drilling looks like. Um, might turn the sound down on it. All you'll hear in terms of sound is just how windy it is on the site. Um, it was very windy here. So I'll get it playing. So this was a site um, in northern Peru. This was our last deep drilling expedition at the peak of Huascaran um, in northern Peru. This was in 2019. Um, and so this is actually in the call between two peaks. There's a north peak and a southern peak of Huascaran. Um, and so they're actually in between them, kind of in this little saddle area um, drilling. But you can see, again, we go about one meter at a time. Um, and they're, they're pulling it out now. And what they'll do is they'll take that tube over to the tent here on the right. Um, or maybe they already did that. <laughs> um, and they take it in there to be processed. So there are people in the tent who are taking measurements on the core, um, looking at the stratigraphy, the layers in the ice, and then they're packing it um, into those, uh, first into plastic and then into those silver tubes. But that gives you an idea of sort of what the drilling looks like um, and what the rigging looks like when it's all set up. And these drills can run on solar panels, um, which again, you know, kind of reducing our, our impact when we're on the ice. Um, but we do have backup generators just in case because sometimes, you know, the weather doesn't always cooperate. So what we'll do next is we will head into our cutting room. All right, so we've got three cutting rooms, um, which are pretty, pretty small rooms here with a bandsaw, again, to cut the ice. 
Um, what you'll see here on the left is a light table. Um, we can put the ice on there, shine light up through it, and it helps us pick out different features in the ice. Um, again, helps us with the stratigraphy, helps us find what we call organics, little plant fragments or bugs in the ice. Um, or we can really see the bubbles in the ice. And we've got this little uh, video here that you can see kind of what the ice looks like. This one's a bit of a, a broken ice core. Um, it's in different pieces there, but it just shows you um, what it looks like under the light table and how those features stand out a little more. We've also got measuring tape alongside, so we can you know, make note of where we see interesting features in the ice. Um, and this really neat camera rigging. Um, so we can take pictures of the ice and videos of the ice as well. So in some cases, you'll see lots of bubbles in the ice. From those bubbles, um, we can actually look at the air composition um, of the bubbles to determine what the you know, atmospheric composition was like you know, thousands of years ago whenever these layers were deposited. Um, so we've got this 800,000 year history of carbon dioxide levels um, in the atmosphere, which is how we know that, you know, it's, it's really unprecedented what we're seeing today. Um, so we don't do that in our lab, um, but we can send the ice away to do that. And so one of the things we're trying to do also is to get um, methane composition. Methane has been done in um, polar cores, like from Antarctica or Greenland, but we're trying to do it with our Waskaran core as well, because um, we think the methane from a tropical core could really tell us something interesting, but we have to make sure it's not contaminated with bacteria, um, which emit meth methane. Um, so that's something we're, we're hoping to do pretty soon here. So what you can see here is the bandsaw. Um, this is what we use to cut the core. Typically when we get a core, we cut it in half lengthwise. Half of that core gets cut down even further, which you can see Emily doing here. Um, she's cutting it down into little cubes. Those cubes will go into those cups um, and those cups are taken into the clean room to be analyzed. So unfortunately it is a destructive method. Um, so you know, when we cut them down into cubes, we let them melt to run them through all of our instruments. Um, but we retain the other half of the core in our freezer as an archive um, because we have ice from regions like Kilimanjaro and uh, Pungak Jaya in Indonesia, where in 10 or 15 years, there won't be ice um, on those sites anymore. But in 10 or 15 years, we might have some new technology to measure things in the ice that we can't even imagine today. And we won't be able to go back to those sites to get more ice, but we'll have it here in our freezer. So we're really preserving it for, for posterity. So our last stop is in our ice core freezers. So you can see here, I'm just gonna let this kind of turn on its own. Um, all of the, it's going a little fast. So all of these tubes, they're all labeled where they're from. Um, so they all contain a, a meter of ice. Um, you can see LSB, this is Larson, Larson shelf B. Um, so that's from Antarctica. Um, but we've got over 7,000 uh, meters of ice. I would argue quite a bit more than that, considering we are at capacity, which means we do not have any more shelf space for our cores. So whenever we bring in a new core, unfortunately, an old core um, has to meet its end. Um, so we, we you know, have to get rid of a core just to make space. Um, but we're trying to expand our freezers. Um, so we're trying to get funds to do that, um, to build out and update the mechanicals that we have. These freezers are almost 30 years old, over 30 years old. Um, they run on backup generators, which again are 30 years old. Um, so we don't know how reliable they are, even though we do have maintenance checks on them. Um, you know, you never know in a storm what's gonna happen. Um, so, Again, hoping to build out um, our facilities more and store even more um, ice cores and really save them um, for future generations because you know, there are many sites that we've been to that at this point it wouldn't even be useful to go back to um, because the ice has just been so decimated. And you know, it melts from the top down. And so you start losing the more present ice 
um, and it gets harder and harder to figure out a time scale for the core um, and to make that data useful um, for anyone. And then as it melts, that water percolates throughout the core and disrupts the signals there. Um, so it, it's it's really difficult, um, and they're very you know the amount of, the number of sites that we can go to are are dwindling um, at this point. So we want to make sure we can get the ice that we can um, for now and save it for those future generations um, that might be able to run really, really neat experiments that we can't think of today. So that was a really uh, quick tour um, of our center. Um, I tried to leave in a good chunk of time for questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. Um, And then, yeah, if there are any questions, please let me know. There are several questions. I'm not sure if Allison maybe had to step away to or Danny, but there are some questions in the chat. We probably have time for a couple. A lot of people are asking about cataloging. They, they like the library of your ice there, Stacy. So the librarians are interested in how you organize all of that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I hate to say it. It's not the most orderly um, freezer. Uh, catalog you'll find. Um, but I will say, um, when I first started at the Bird Center, which was now over 10 years ago, um, my first job um, as a grad student was to organize those cores. So I spent a good amount of time in those freezers, which are at negative 30 degrees. Um, it was, you know, those days where, you know, your eyelashes were covered in, in frost. And one of the things for me is that they kept sticking to my hat. And so your eyes kind of get stuck open and <laughs> um but yeah so we created all these labels on the shelves um to to organize the cores but then of course once a new core comes in it's just make space make space wherever you can find space and so then it all gets <laughs> disorganized again wow. I think been, um, answering questions as they've come up in the chat for the most part um yeah but but it did seem a lot of people suddenly woke up and we're very interested in the fact that there were all these things sitting on shelves that needed to be thoroughly cataloged and, and accessible. And Jason said, this collection started Mountain Ice Core Collection. Does that mean that it was like the first Mountain Ice Core Collection in the world? Yes, so we have the largest tropical um, ice core collection in the world. And so before, um, and it's Lonnie Thompson and Ellen Thompson who started it. Fortunately, you get to see, um, you get to hear from Ellen very soon. Um, but yeah, so in, in the 1970s, um, they were the first ones to go, Lonnie was the first one to go to this Kelkaya site, and that was the first tropical core that was ever obtained. Um, so before that, all of the drilling had been done in Greenland and Antarctica. Um, so I think the first core ever drilled was like in 1966 in Camp Century, Greenland. Um, but the idea was always to get to Antarctica, to try to drill in Antarctica. Um, and they did that, and then it was sort of like, okay, let's find somewhere new. And, and Lonnie wanted to go to Kelkaya, which is the largest tropical ice cap in the world. Um, so he really pioneered going to these tropical locations, these high mountain regions. Uh, and someone asked for a good recommendation for a book on Great Lakes glaciation, and uh, Danny's put a link there to a record at OSU's catalog. Um, Ed has pointed out that one of the authors of the book is a professor at Western Michigan University. Um, Jason has said that just speaking to what, what is decided, what can be um, removed, deaccessioned, de and that's very smart that you deaccession ice cores that you feel confident you can go back to that site again. Yes. So it's usually. It's usually a very old core from, let's say, Antarctica or something. Um, like we've got cores from, you know, the 1980s um, that have just been sitting for so long that, you know, we don't know, we don't know the, really the effects of long-term storage on the ice. 
Um, I mean, that's all we, that's all we have at this point, you know, we have to kind of preserve it. Um, so typically those are the ones that, that go first. It sounds like a good recommendation from Jason, two mile time machine. Yes, highly recommend. <laughs> That's by Richard Alley. Right away. <laughs> this has been fascinating. Um, Stacy, your presentation was really great. Um, as I said in the chat, I am in awe of what field scientists have to, to figure out and just the physical labor that goes into it um, under sometimes grueling conditions. It's pretty amazing. Yes, I agree. <laughs> And I don't get to do as much field work as I would like, um, but there, there are some people here that are just real troopers. <laughs> I was interested in the fact that you did your undergraduate work in North Carolina and then went off to Alaska and you've stayed in polar environments or cold environments anyway. Wondered how that transition had worked for you. Yeah, so what I was doing in Alaska was um, the research I was doing up there was actually looking at sort of um, pollution from cruise ships um, and how that was affecting the landscapes around um, the Gulf of Alaska, um, which very interesting, um, very topical. Wasn't super interested in though. Um, and so, but when I was there, I really fell in love with, with the Arctic and I saw kind of firsthand the, the changes that were occurring in the Arctic. And then ironically to study the Arctic more, I had to leave the Arctic and go to Ohio um, to study it. So that's, that's what got me here today. And Jason, I hope that you are able to secure a communications manager so you can field all of the questions that you're getting and interest from the public and members of Congress. Yeah, we have a very good team, so we're always looking to expand that, and we are always pursuing grant funds to increase the scope of the audiences we reach. So, thank you. Well, I, I say thank goodness for NOAA, NSF, and NASA, and whoever else is funding your research. Yes. And I put my email in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I'm sure in Ellen's talk coming up, she'll answer any other questions you have. Um, anything I know came from her, so. We have lots of people saying thank you and how much they enjoyed your presentations and they just appreciate your work. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for sitting and watching. <laughs> and I also put a link in chat to the uh, polar archives that we have within the libraries that has some digital exhibits that people might be interested in as well. Yes, Thank if you're you interested know. in Admiral Byrd or yeah. a lot of other polar explorers, that's a that's a place to go. Back to you, Danny. Okay, we will restart at about one o'clock, so it gives you guys a couple of minutes. Uh, let's go ahead and start at 102, give everybody about five minute, uh, actually now about a, a four minute break. Uh, so we will resume at 102.